Hello and welcome to Up Your Vibe. And today's show is about something that I'm very aware of. We're going to be talking about depression and how that sometimes can lead to suicide. I'm very well aware of this from being um, subject to depression myself and having two family members commit suicide, one of only 23 and my sister of uh, 55 years of age. And the effect on the family is extraordinary when someone takes their life. And someone who knows a lot about this subject, it is a field of expertise, is Suzanne Kellner Zink. Hello, Suzanne. How are you today? I'm doing really well. How are you doing? I am really doing well, actually. I think I'm probably the best I've ever felt in my whole life. Fantastic. That's a wonderful thing to hear. It is, isn't it? So I am going to be asking you lots and lots of questions because I have a good idea where depression comes from. And in order to deal with my depression, I studied in lots of different fields like hypnosis, NLP, EFT, psychology. But you are very trained yourself. You have quite a lot of qualifications. So would you like to go through what you're qualified at? Sure. I'm actually a trainer of hypnosis, neurolinguistic programming, also known as NLP, and something called timeline therapy, which Tad James actually originated, which is a form of neurolinguistic programming. And it's all under hypnosis because hypnosis is nothing more than bypassing the critical faculty of the conscious mind, otherwise known as the prefrontal cortex, where you reason, judge, and rationalize everything into really the amygdala in the hippocampus where our emotions live. So that is what we do with this particular work. So when someone comes to you and they say, I'm depressed, I'm suicidal, what's your first course of action with that particular client? Well, that's a really excellent question because I don't think many hypnotists who've never worked in the conventional world of mental health would ever know how to do this. But the first thing you need to do is you have to know if this falls in your scope of care because this can be deadly. So it's not for just anyone to just play with because they think they know something from a weekend course in hypnosis. Sorry, no. So the first thing I do is I have a chat with them and I find out if they're suicidal at that moment. If they are, and it's never been this way actually, they really need to go in patient ward. Generally what happens is someone will tell me that they've had suicidal ideation or maybe in the past they had a suicidal event. So what I do with them is I kind of joke with them, but it's very real. They have to write a contract. I make them do it in their own hand. I tell them exactly what to write. And basically what it says is that they're not going to do anything stupid, meaning any kind of suicidal actions. Instead, they're to either call me, leave a message if I'm not available, and I'll get back to them, or write me an email, and I always write back. And I answer every single thing in there. These emails take a long time to write because you don't want somebody to take it wrong, but at the same time, you need to be very clear in terms of the meaning of what you're saying and be direct, but do it lovingly and compassionately. That's what these people need. And that's what the conventional mental health people don't give, because if you don't have an appointment to see a therapist, you have to wait until your next appointment. And if you have someone in crisis, they're not going to want to go to the freaking hospital. They don't want to have their freedom taken away. They don't want to be put on a bunch of drugs that make them not feel right and that don't help. By the way, before you even get there, um, Dr. Irvin Kirsch and Dr. Walter Brown out of Brown University, Kirsch is actually out of Harvard University, have been doing placebo studies on antidepressants for a better part of 40 years. They don't work any better than a placebo. So if you wonder why you've tried every freaking antidepressant out there and nothing's worked, perhaps that's why. But it gets deeper than that. We'll get into the physiological issues that cause depression in a little while. Okay. But in answer to your question, they need to write a contract. They need to understand that I'm there for them. They need to understand that this is intensive work and that I am dedicating myself to helping them overcome their depression in the best way I know how by knowing that they're unconditionally loved and accepted and that there's and that there's really no reason for me not to get back to them unless I'm out of the country or something you know okay. so you, you talk about a, a contract um, mm -hmm. a contract for safety yes a contract for safety do you believe that the contract is actually binding and it works oh yeah it does work yeah. in all the years that I've been doing this 
<clears throat> and I've been doing hypnosis for 17 and a half years now, okay? And I learned this actually in conventional therapy at my very first job at the gathering place. It was a social club for mentally ill adults. And this is what the master's level clinicians would do with the patients there, or, you know, the members of the club or whatever, the people who went there, if they were feeling depressed, they would have to sign a contract for safety if they didn't need to go into a hospital. So I learned that directly from them as a way to do it. In all the years, I lost exactly one person. He was a guy in his 60s. He was a major drug addict. He was living with a woman. It's so interesting. I was on a radio program. Which you normally would have to pay, but instead I did the work for her friend, okay? She put me on nationally on five times and through Boston radio station four times. So that was how I got paid, and I got a couple of clients from it, which is great. Yeah. Well, if they had called to let me know that he had spent 10000 of her dollars <laughs> on a credit card and that he was not looking so good. Maybe I could have intervened, but I got a call after the fact, and that's the only person I ever lost to okay. suicide. He had been a drug addict many, many years previous, got involved in actually, um, oh, my God, what's the name? In Boston. Um, they were looking for him forever and ever and ever, and they finally caught him in, um, oh, God. I can't even think of the guy's name. This is like really, really bad. But anyway, really big um, mafia type guy over there. They finally caught and um, put in prison after years and years and years. They were looking for him. Anyway, this particular guy had gotten involved with this group when he was just a kid. And that was the beginning of it all. So interesting, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think drugs, drugs are very damaging to human beings. They cause a number of problems within families as well, not just for the person that takes the drugs. Oh, my God, yes. And it, um, it seems to detach the moral side of the brain. So whatever they do, they just can't take responsibility for. And then they believe well, everybody else's problem to make them well again. I can explain to you how that all works if you want, the physiology behind it. Well, I think we'll stick with the depression <laughs> for now. So maybe we'll come back to that later. Long should... story short, it's dopamine. Yeah, <laughs> oh, exactly, yes. Yeah, it's definitely down to the dopamine. So when someone gets depressed, obviously the dopamine is suppressed also because they just can't get that happiness back in their life again. And it's, it, it's, it could be... It's from, not just that, though. It's, it's more complicated than that. That's what I'm saying. It's, it could be for a number of reasons. So mm -hmm. if, if you can start to discuss that, that would be really helpful for those people who are now stuck in that and finding a way out. So they can understand a little bit more about what is going on right now that makes them right. depressed. <clears throat> all right, so let me just explain, first of all, what the mental health depression is all about, because there's different kinds, okay, mm -hmm. in terms of how they label the different diagnoses, all right, according to the, the Diagnostic Standards Manual, DSM, that they use. And then I'll explain other reasons for depression to happen that have nothing to do with mental health, okay? Because it is complicated, and that's why people who do not understand it don't belong working in it. So the first thing is that we have different kinds of depression in the mental health world. The first thing is a, a unipolar depression, major depressive, would be when they have episodes of depression. They're usually given the, um, the medications, and over in the UK, the National Health Service will only give antidepressants to those people. They don't even give it to people who don't have anything other than that because they know it doesn't work. Done the research, it's true. Uh -huh. Next, we have something called dysthymia. Dysthymia is just a low-grade depression that people feel and they never can feel happy, okay? So that's called dysthymia. Then we have something called cyclothymia. Cyclothymia is when you're going up and down, but not as much as what a bipolar person would do, otherwise known as manic depression in years past. So they just go up and down and they never have like a normal, natural, even um, emotion. Then you have bipolar, which used to be manic depression. You have two kinds. You have bipolar 2, which I had actually been diagnosed with back in the 80s, and I got rid of it through five minutes of timeline therapy with Tad James, true story. And basically what happens with, with bipolar 2 is that you have a lack of judgment, you'll have a flight of ideas, you're still kind of glued to reality, you're not having any psychotic features, but you're not really making really good judgments. You might get involved in a whole bunch of different businesses, never follow through, very irritable, very in people's faces very strong-minded in the hyper way, you know, when you have the hypomanic phase, yeah, which is below yeah. mania, and then you can get depressed, but you're not getting psychotically depressed where you're, where you're going to have suicide necessarily. Now, you can have um, bipolar one is when they really do get psychotic. They think they're Jesus, and it really looks like schizophrenia, but it really isn't, where they think that they're people other than what they are, and they have those psychotic features, 
and they can get really depressed to the point where suicidality is going to happen. 15% of all manic depressives will end up committing suicide. 20% of depressives, manic depressives, 15% will use drugs to bring them up and down. Actually, um, that's what happened to Julie Garland and Patty Duke over here in the movies and in TV. They were given drugs. In fact, um, Patty Duke wrote a beautiful autobiography. Um, I don't know if that was, Brilliant Mind, I think is the name of the book. And it explains her entire history and how they were drugging her up and down to keep her going on the set. And same thing happened with Judy Garland in the movies. And then, um, <clears throat> so we have these different kinds of issues. They're different sorts of illnesses, but what I really understand as a hypnotist NLP person is if it's emotional, there's different things that you need to clear in order to get rid of the actual affect of depression, okay? Because our thoughts, you will understand as a hypnotist NLP person, our thoughts create our physiology. It's not the other way around. And we know that from research that's been done for quite a few years now. Now, other ways that people can get depressed are these, and we have to think very seriously about this. You think about the shootings, the mass shootings here in America, probably due to antidepressants, which are known to cause homicidal and um, suicidal behavior, which is why we have the black labels on the prescription bottles themselves or on the boxes. Mm -hmm. We have other issues. We have things called, shall we say, hormonal imbalances. If you have a thyroid that's really slow, a hypothyroid, you're going to be depressed, physically depressed. You may not be thinking the way you were. And it's not necessarily depression in terms of feeling sad or angry because you can feel sad, which is the depression being forced toward yourself. And anger is blaming the rest of the world for the problems, right? So you see that in men a lot. These are different types, but you know, these things can be caused actually by malnutrition of nutrition due to things like leaky gut. If you're not getting the proteins to break down to the amino acids, you're not going to make the neurotransmitters, which are mostly made in the gut, we now understand, right, in your biome, which need to make the, the dopamine, the serotonin, our FFRN, the GABA, so you can sleep, because if you don't sleep, you'll be depressed too, right? Yeah. All these things can happen as well. Celiac disease, same situation where they're having proteins not coming in. So we have a whole slew of different things that we really kind of need to look at. On top of that is we have something called loss. I had a woman who came in to see me many moons ago. She could not exercise. She needed to lose 70 pounds. She had a degenerative bone disease, really rare. And she was trying to swim, and her physical therapist said, stop doing it. You're injuring your bones more than you need to. So we had to go through the loss of being able to dance, be able to walk, be able to swim. And then she did slowly lose the weight. She actually did take it off in about nine months. And because it's mainly food, they say that when you exercise, you more than make up for the calories you've burned off in your exercise anyway. So it's really about the food choices. But these are the things that we need to take under consideration. And also carbs, too many carbs, you'll crash down and you won't feel so good. So a good, healthy diet. So what about those people who've suffered trauma and events? Well, trauma is actually really easy to take care of in terms of neurolinguistic programming and hypnosis because all you need to do is desensitize the trauma, number one. There's a very easy process that you do that takes a matter of minutes to do for each particular trauma. Mm -hmm. So like if I was to take someone in, I do a detailed personal history and I learn all of the events that happened throughout their whole life. And those events are all attached to their age when these things happened, all right, the trauma happened, as well as <clears throat> the actual events themselves. So we can do a process that allows them to discharge the emotion. And then I do a deeper hypnotic process where they're able to talk to the person or people involved yeah. in order to do the forgiveness work. One needs to forgive. You don't forget. You just forgive so you're no longer carrying around that anger. And then they do inner child work to let them know that their inner child no longer needs to run them anymore to protect them. There is another person, a type of person as well that uh, falls into a different category. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of person that keeps their stories going and going and going because yep. <laughs> they benefit to themselves for it. You know, this learned helplessness that they get from being in depression means that they keep it because it gets them attention. It gets people running about for them. It gets them treatment. It gets them with other people and they form toxic relationships. And it gives them that camaraderie in the toxic group of depressed people that, um, you know, I see this myself. And how do we get them to drop their stories? And how do we get people to let go of these, 
these events that's happened in their life, whether it be from this type of depression or any of the other de depressions that you have talked about. And by the way, we don't refer to bipolar as a depression here. It's a diagnosis for bipolar. I never had any idea that in the USA that they talk about this is depression. It is, it is a form because you have your highs and your lows. I mean, it's bipolar. You go hypomanic or manic, and then the other side is depression. That's what makes it bipolar, right? You have high and low, of yeah. course. Yeah. You can't call it, and the other one's unipolar depression when you only have depression. Yeah. So in answer to your question, and this is a very, very excellent question, two answers to you, okay, for you this, because there's two different kinds of people, all right? Mm -hmm. There's the people who, see, my job as a person who is hiring on a client, all right, I don't take on just anybody. They need to be ready to change now. That's the whole purpose of NLP. If you want to be sick and take antidepressants to see your shrink for the last, I don't know, 50 years of your life, by all means, go do that. This is what you want to do. I am not your person because I'm not interested in having people hold on to their stuff. However, my job when I do the original consult on the phone before I hire anybody on as a client is to find out if they are interested in being well if they're interested in letting it go. And if they are, the most important thing I do in the first segment when I do their detailed personal history or the first hypnotic session afterwards, depending on what's going on with them and the time involved, I will do a thing where we find out their compelling future. I'll put them in a hypnotic state and I'll have them figure out what's really important to them, more important to them, not just about themselves and their family, who cares? Something really important for themselves so they know that there's a larger reason a purpose a calling for them to be here on planet earth and that is more important than being sick and holding on to the sickness if you have a compelling future that's one piece of it then you also have to understand the cause and the purpose the cause is what actually initiated it. so that would be the initial sensitizing event in nlp terms yes and then the purpose is why they're holding on to it all right if we know those two things and have a compelling um a compelling reason for them to move on, they'll move on in their lives. The problem is in conventional therapy, all they do is reinvigorate the horrible things that happen over and over again because they talk their same story over and over again, and when do they ever heal? The other problem we have is that they know what happened, they might know why it happened, they don't know how to get rid of it. Why? Because these people don't learn how the mind actually works. Mm -hmm. And that, that, is, that is the actual key to it, isn't it? Understanding your own mind, how it works, and, and what it's actually doing for you, which is most of the time trying to help you survive. Exactly. That's exactly right. Let me pick up on what you're saying, because it's a very, very important point you make. What happens is, and I'm going to explain this in terms of the three minds, okay? So we have our first mind, and I like to talk about it as the conscious mind is the mind that thinks it knows what it's doing. But if it actually knew what it was doing, you'd stop doing the stuff you want to stop doing and you'd do the stuff that you want to do, but most people don't, yeah. right? So that's your, your prefrontal cortex, reasoning, rationalization, judgment, and that's what the conventional therapists are stuck with. That's why their work doesn't work. Mm -hmm. All right, then you have your unconscious mind. That's the protection that you're talking about. Your unconscious, subconscious mind, Milton Erickson used to call it unconscious mind, emphasizing the un because it's mm -hmm. not conscious, right? Okay. Mind, because, you know, it's trying to... to, to to protect you from those things that your conscious mind cannot handle. Sometimes this stuff is repressed, which is why we need to go into the amygdala and the hippocampus, emotional mind, in order to understand what that material is. You cannot change something you do not even know it is. Mm -hmm. So you go to a hypnotist, NLP practitioner to do that work. But secondarily, sometimes the unconscious is holding on so much protection-wise that you can't even do it with a hypnotist. So then what do you do? Great question. That's why I bring them into their higher conscious or their um, superconscious mind, which there is really the collective unconscious, as Jung would call it, your spirituality. So I ask my clients always in their initial um, meeting with me what their divine is. Do you call it Jesus? Do you call it God? Do you call it the creator as I do? Do you call it the universe? I don't care what you call it. Whatever it is, is fine. Buddha. And what I do is I have them, it's a suggestion. Hypnosis is based on suggestions. So once they're in trance, I just ask them to fill their divine, call it in, you know, and then I just count them up. And then I have them with their divine so they know they're protected with their divine. That gets the unconscious defense mechanism out of the way so that we can do what we need to do very effectively and quickly because the superconscious is about 100,000 times quicker than the unconscious, which is 100 times quicker than the conscious mind. So why do you want to waste all this time working in talk therapy when you don't have to? Yeah. <laughs> Just get to it and get it done. You know, the idea is to do it really fast, right? Elman and, as well, mainly Estelle, Elman, he did amazing work in like, 
minutes to maybe an hour. He was able to do pretty much anything. So what's the excuse of all these hypnotists making people come see them forever and ever and ever for single Exactly. Stuff? You know, there has to be some ethics uh, that's gone wrong there because I hear of people that are in therapy for years and I think the maximum I've ever had anybody in in my care is six six weeks and I think wow that's a long time even six weeks it's the only, the only exception to that Paula actually is people who have addictions if you're dealing with people with drug addiction you really have to know that they've really let go of their playground as they say in AA and their playmates you know and they've moved on but other than that, my, my anorexics and bulimics is usually about six months to help make sure that they aren't going back and doing those really bad behaviors. But other than that, you're right. It shouldn't be any more than like four to six weeks. My sex addicts are between four and six weeks and everybody else, guess what? It's a matter of, I do sessions. I do long sessions, okay? Mm -hmm. So my sessions are about two to three hours and usually between three and four of them, most things are done. Yeah. So give me an example of how you would help someone let go of depression? Well, again, it kind of depends. I, I, I imagine you're talking about mental health depression where you're, you're dealing with trauma because otherwise you have to deal physiologically with whatever that problem is and deal with it physiologically, right? Take care of the medication or deal with the thyroid or whatever. Um, okay, so what I have to do with depressed people is I do the detailed personal history because I have to find out basically what created, I need to find the, the reason why they caused the problem for themselves. So the and drive, we, we call that a driver. Right, right. Yeah. That would be the, well, yeah. yeah. Well, the driver is why they continue doing it, but the cause mm -hmm. is the initial initiating yeah. event in our parlance here. And so anyway, so I, we have a question on the um, detailed personal history, which Tad James created, which is, can you do the problem now? So I want them to go into those horrible feeling states, and sometimes I'll, I'll really be very emotionally into it, get them angry or whatever. I want them to go there because if they can go there then, then I know that we can decreate it. They'll show me how to decreate it. Very, very important. And if they can't do it consciously, guess what? I do what Jerry Kahn would call, I whack them over the head with hypnosis and we just do it that way. Whatever it takes to make it happen, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. Then what happens from there is I get the entire history in terms of all the events, all the traumas, all the inner child stuff that happened because, you know, if you had different traumas by different people over your life, different inner childs, through your life are going to be taken over and trying to protect you in different ways. So exactly. we have to wipe all that stuff out, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a process. So the first thing I do is I figure out what their compelling future is. All right. That's the reason to come over it. Then what I'll do is I'll get rid of, if they have parts therapy to get rid of their conscious, unconscious mind, so they'll come together. That's what Milton Erickson would tell you why a person will come see a hypnotist, right? He was a hypnotist and a psychiatrist, right? And then what we need to do is we need to, um, I do timeline therapy for all the negative emotional removal because I want them at a really good baseline to do the deeper work. Then we do all the um, events that cause them traumas. We go through that really quickly. And then I do all of the, um, the clearing of the forgiveness and the inner child work. I do that together. And then boundaries. No one's going to have these problems if they have lousy boundaries. So if you're there feeling sorry for yourself and you want everyone to dance around you because you had such a horrible life, trust me, go spend some time with the children in the cancer center and you understand what being in the moment is. You know, so I don't really have a lot of patience for it. So so what, what about if that person exactly. doesn't um, exactly know why they feel the way they do? You said you go back in a timeline. What if they can't identify any event that's made them feel like that? You know what happens? Well, first of all, remember, some people, and that's actually a good question because Antonio, my, my one client, he was wonderful. I couldn't get him to release anger in timeline therapy because why? His idiot so called license. Uh, therapist person in a special program that he was in, living at, told me he'd be dead or in jail by the time he was 18 years old. He saw me right before his 17th birthday. Yes, I'm telling you, a licensed person said that to him. Wow. Yes, indeed. So <clears throat> he saw black. So what I did was I regressed him to cause and just straight hypnosis, got that cleared up, and then I was able to do the timeline after that. Now, you have to understand something. If we're working in the superconscious mind, they can generally get a sensibility of the thing that has happened. They'll figure it out. And we have to understand, too, you know, the way that our minds work is that we're going to delete a lot of stuff. You know, Virginia Satir taught us how the unconscious works by basically learning stuff by understanding that chair is a chair is a chair and that we delete stuff that distorts stuff. So our memory isn't really uh, a normal memory. You know, you, you know, your sister and yourself, you have a sister, whatever. Well, remember things quite differently because of that deletion. So 
what we want them to do is come up with what they understand is the issue and that's what we take as the issue we don't really care as long as it gets the results frankly i don't care as long as i get the results and i'm sure my clients don't care as long as they get the results and they can be lifted from their depression who cares right it's like this whole idea about past lives or you know do past lives exist i don't know if they exist but if the person believes in their unconscious mind and that's how it had james to say i don't care what your conscious mind believes because otherwise you wouldn't be here i care what your unconscious mind believes yep. so you go there right and you take care of it from that perspective sometimes it's genealogical too you know people can learn behaviors from zero to eight years old it's all imprinted from the people in their environment and they take on these qualities and I've had that happen where I had to sever a person from someone whose qualities they took on and that released them from the depression. So it really depends on the reason. There's many, many different ways that people can feel depressed. There are. And obviously you've touched on the communication model there, how we generalize things, how we mm -hmm. distort things. And of course that happens due to our perception. It's what we believe our truth is. And people, our internal representation right yeah, in our mind they will wholeheartedly stick to the facts that their truth is the right truth and everybody else is lying which of course is a big deal for eyewitness testimony it makes it very uh, very unsafe in conviction relying on eyewitness testimony uh yeah it doesn't work they, they already know research wise says it doesn't work 95 percent of the time or more they're almost always wrong but it's, it's irrelevant if you believe it's your truth that's what we have to work with this is basically what you've said isn't no, it well what happens is this all right that's different than in a, in a court of law okay that's yeah. forensic hypnosis let them worry about that i don't yeah. specialize in that but in terms of clinical care is concerned hey nlp presupposition is that we meet the client where they're at right and then pace them and lead them to where they are we have to enter their own world and that's what a lot of shrinks do wrong in my estimation psychiatrists psychologists they want their clients especially the master level mental health people they want them to already be healed hello you haven't done the work to heal them how are they going to be healed and, and be going where you want them to go we got to meet them mm -hmm. where they're at pace them and lead them to what they want their objectives to be not what we want them to be and that's another beautiful thing about hypnosis nlp we don't tell the clients what they want they come to us and tell us what their objectives are and that's also in the detailed personal history right two questions are there. i love these questions how will you know that you've received the results and what's going to change for you all right so so they know basically what's changing in their thinking and their behavior so they know that they've received the results they have hired me to get evidence procedures what tad would call it and that's really important do you get that in conventional therapy no you don't know most of the people over here don't even know what their diagnoses are yeah, because in conventional therapy they're treating the symptom and they're not treating the person holistically as yes. a whole so all right so that's another good point all right so this is the beautiful thing about the way i was trained by the jameses okay so we have these things called symptoms, right? So a depressed person feels kind of low energy. They have a lot of negative thoughts toward themselves. You know, this is why they do the things that they do to drink and self-medicate, whatever. And then you have um, apathy about doing the things that you used to do. This, we'll call those three symptoms. We we'll call that depression, okay? okay? No longer doing the things I used to do. That's the presenting problem. I'm not interested in the presenting problem. Yes, I have to clear it. What I care about is why did you create that presenting problem? Why is that there? That's what Tad would call the general problem. So when I do my work in neurolinguistics and hypnosis, I'm looking at the general problem. Okay, so you never felt loved as a child. You felt your parents abandoned you. Um, you feel like you've been abused. Maybe you felt neglected. Maybe you had a parent who was drug addicted and wasn't there for you. Maybe your, your parent had their own mental health issues so they couldn't emotionally be there. Whatever the situation is. Yeah. So they have this thing coded in their, in their internal representation, coded in their subconscious mind. that tells them, I'm not worthy of love or, or I don't believe that, that I was meant to be on this earth or I don't know why I was brought out into this world because the world sucks. You know, whatever their general problem is. Yeah. And then my job is to clear Every single thing that came out of that detailed personal history, which takes about two and a half hours to do on average, sometimes three, depending on the complexity of the case. And then by doing that and matching it up with their objectives for the work that we're doing together, that gets them healed. Yeah. But you have to understand the cause, the purpose, and their compelling future and have all that other stuff and do a really good clearing, which is why... You know, you can do timeline therapy and let go of depression. That's only one piece that I'll do. I'll do anger, sadness, fear, guilt, depression if I have a depressed person, right? Yeah. And I might even do shame and guilt because a person might be fearful, you know, they might be, <laughs> be very upset because of shame and guilt. But you find that out in their detailed personal history yeah. in terms of what's going on with all the people that ever were there in their lives. Plus right, appreciation. Right. They have to have appreciation for people too. You said something really important then. You said it quite casually, so I want you to rewind back. Mm -hmm. 
And that is the fact that we actually create those issues in our mind. It isn't what other people have done to us per se. It is what we make of that situation. We create those beliefs in our mind. Even if they're not the truth, we still create them. Yes, and you know how that happens? I'll tell you how that happens. Think about it this way. Now, you know hypnotism, so you know, but maybe the audience doesn't, that between before you're born, even when you're in, in the fetus, as a fetus growing, if you have really bad effects and you have an abusive father abusing your mom and you're in there, you're going to get that negative energy. Exactly. This happens, all right? So what happens is from pre-birth all the way to like eight years old, we are unconscious. That means that everything is literally taped in our unconscious mind. So you may be consciously unconscious or you might be unconsciously unconscious of this material. And that is imprinted in your unconscious mind in the amygdala and in the um, hippocampus of the mind. Now, this is the thing. You are not able to reason, rationalize, or judge at that point in time. You have not develop your prefrontal cortex enough to do this. This is why teenagers do impulsive things. They don't think about the natural consequences of their actions. They're just thinking in the now. You see a kid, you know, you can turn them around in a few seconds, right? They're, they're in the now. They're always in the now. Yeah. Now it's a new now, right? Adults don't do that. However, what we have to understand is that when we code this stuff inside our minds, our unconscious mind, right, the amelia, where the emotions ride, this is how we imprint the meaning. We don't understand that our mother was really upset about maybe being stopped by a cop on her way home. We don't understand that our father might have had a boss come down to him. And maybe he got laid off his job, and that's why he's taking it on us. We can't do that. We don't have the mental capacity at that stage. So what is a kid going to do? Well, if they're highly emotional, and remember, trance happens in a highly emotional state, either positive or negative, it doesn't matter. It's going to go right into that person's mind, that kid's mind, and they're going to think that they're unworthy of love. Okay, that's a really good way to get depressed. Yes. All right. Only one of many. Okay. So this is the way that it happens. So this is happening. So so going back to what we were talking about in terms of needing to go back to the inner child, because that child that had that event happen, right, has coded in that way. We have to do the clearing for that child that is protecting the adult from having these issues happen, even if that parent's been dead for thirty years, because. Mm -hmm. The inner child doesn't know that. It can't reason, rationalize, or judge. Mm -hmm. It's stuck at that emotional state. So we have to take care of all those clearings in order to make this really, truly work and be done. That's the difference between the depth and breadth of what I do in my work versus a lot of other hypnotists who will just do one or two of these things and they're not really taking care of the entire thing that needs to be done. Yeah, it is, it, is, it is a very, um, oh, how can I say it? it? When you go through such a process, you actually feel the weight being taken from you, the weight of the burden leaving you. Lighter and, and brighter. Yeah, yeah, and from my experience as well, once you let go of these burdens, these beliefs that you've created in your mind, uh, you are actually seem to lose years in, in your well, looks physically, and you, you become more physically fit because of the mind-body connection going on, your body responds to your mind. And this is well documented now. There's, uh, you know, the neuroscience has proved that this is the case. We it's talked about that before. Yep. Yeah. Thoughts create your physiology, people. If you don't have healthy thoughts, you better start thinking about what you need to do to get them cleared up. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So when does depression cross the line into suicide great question what happens is and there there is actually there are steps that people go down okay and i learned this working conventional mental health you are not going to learn this in hypnosis school because they don't know it so this comes from clinical psychology so what happens is a person will have something happen to them and it gets worse and worse and they might actually get to the point where they're feeling really, really, really bad about something. So that gets into maybe suicidal ideation. So all that means is that a person is thinking it would be better to be dead than alive because it's too hard to be alive because of the pain involved in the depressed thinkings. I'm a horrible person. I'm not worthy of being alive, blah, blah, blah. All right, that's all going on in their head. Yeah. Then what happens is they might get a plan. Now, this is the dangerous thing where you're giving antidepressants to people especially if they have bipolar because they're going to cycle right up out of that depression if they don't have a mood stabilizer on it. That's how I was diagnosed. So what happens is all of a sudden, not only are they depressed, but they have the energy, right? 
and their happiness now because they know they have a way out of it and that's when they do the suicide. So they have to be very careful in terms of how they give these drugs and they also have to be careful in terms of not allowing someone to sink that low down into it. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Well, the way that you do that is you let someone know that you actually give a damn about them. How do you do that? You spend the time listening to them. You help them reframe what they're thinking. You help them understand that maybe they had no control, like this woman who I helped in my, my, my sister's PTSD group. She was probably six or seven years old when she's you know, feeling shameful and upset that she couldn't save her dad from dying of cancer. I don't know a six-year-old who has any power over that, right? And then taking care of her younger siblings, right, at this very young age. So mm -hmm. what do you do? You reframe it and you let her know, as a child, what could you really do as the adult? And I did all that healing work. I did it all right there on that particular um, live. It's all there for 45 minutes, going through the whole process with her. So she's able to let that go because she realizes she was not responsible. And was like, if the doctors couldn't handle it, what makes you think as a child you would be able to? Exactly. I mean, really, truly, do you think it's time to let it go? So it's about helping them understand the realities as an adult versus what they had as a child where they can't reason, rationalize, or judge. What, what I have noticed when people do take their lives is that there is another process that they go through also. Um, if they can identify enough protective factors, um, that is enough to keep them here. But even those protective factors can wear off in time as they disassociate themselves from them. They step back, they they don't want to see their children anymore or their relatives. They become isolated because they feel that if they can disassociate themselves now, it's not going to be so painful for those people when they take the step to take their life. Well, actually what happens, they dissociate actually, well, disassociation isn't really a good word because disassociate means that you're not really in your body, you're feeling like you're out of body. But they will isolate even as a depressed person. That's one of the the um, presenting symptoms. They do isolate a lot and they get more and more in their own head, which is why it's important for them to be, to have friends and people who care to constantly get them out in the world, to get them out of their head, number one. And then the other thing that we have to understand is that, you know, a person who is basically psychotically depressed and has already made the de this decision to commit suicide has disassociated themselves from the people in their lives. They can't care about those people anymore because they're in so much pain. So that's where it goes. And they feel relief. They smile. They're happy. You don't even know that they're suicidal and they're going to do anything at this point because they're just feeling the relief. Oh, I have a plan. I have the energy. I'm going to do my plan. Boom, done. They're not thinking about anybody else. They can't. They're just in their own head dissociated from anything. And that's really where part of the psychosis, you know, we're talking about the psychotic depression. This is what they talk about, you know, that they're not in their own life anymore. They're totally out of it by that point. Yes, yeah. I saw that myself with my sister. Uh, she really wasn't there. It was like she would go through the motions. Mm -hmm. She would still attend to her self-care. She would still go out and buy things. She would still eat. Uh, but you looked in her eyes and you could see that her soul, just wasn't, it. Yeah, just her soul just wasn't there yeah. anymore. Looking through you instead of at you, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and it, <laughs> it was only a matter of time. And she did sign a contract with me, but it made no difference because at the end of the day, she didn't want to be here anymore. Her grief was so much that it was too painful for her to stay any longer. And it was killing us seeing her like that. So this is a really, really good point and something that we need to make really, really clear, especially to protect practitioner people out there who think they're going to save all their patients, clients' lives. Get over it. Yeah. Every individual is going to make the decisions that they are going to make, and you have no control over it. The only thing that you can do is be present, do your best to let them know that you love and care, them un care for them unconditionally, and do what you can. However, if a person is making a decision to do what they're going to decide to do, there is nothing you can do, including psychiatrists, to help them. They don't want the help. So this goes into this whole thing about boundaries and understanding basically what can be done and what cannot be done. This is why over here in the States, in many of the, of the U.S. states, they have laws uh, to protect people from themselves, and if they're going to be homeopathic, like kill other people, they'll put them into a mental institution in order to protect them. Yeah. However, even there, people manage to kill themselves. Because why? They're going to do what they want to do. You cannot stop someone who is really, truly going to do this thing. Why do people think that they can play freaking God and goddess 
It's impossible. So I tell my folks, and actually I have a, I have a little bit of a story of a person who I was talking to many moons ago now about depression. He was really pissed off at his friend's psychiatrist for giving the friend the antidepressants or whatever, and that person committing suicide. And I said, look, no one has the control over another being. You do your best to help them, but if they don't want the help, the only person responsible is that person themselves. They did it on their own. End of story. Let it go. And that's, that's the truth. And this is true of anyone, drug addicts, anybody. Until somebody is ready for the help, it's like um, Stuart Wilde, who I'm talking about in my lives <clears throat> right now, on my personal page, Suzanne Connors Inc. on Facebook. He talks a lot about people being in their own place of evolution. We're all doing our own evolution at our own pace. And it's not up to us to protect people or to do things they have not asked us to do. It is not our job to force ourselves on anybody. What we need to do is to be present. And when they want the help, they'll take the help. We can suggest that we can help them. And if they want to do it, they'll do it. And if not, you need to let it go. Yeah, and that person will will things. make that decision one way or another. Of course. The only excuse is really if you have like a, a minor child. But I haven't really seen minor child, although we do have a problem now here with 10-year-olds, and that's why I started the Facebook Live. Do you realize that the third largest killer of kids here in America from 10, 10 years old, 10 mm. to 24, is suicide. Oh, it's, very, it's very similar here in the UK as well. There's a huge What problem. are we adults doing wrong with these kids? Maybe we're not listening to them. Maybe we're putting too much pressure on them. They all have to go to Ivy, Ivy League schools, whether or not they have the ability. Please, let us get real. I think it goes much deeper than that, Suzanne. You know, we have uh, people that are deeply unhappy already with emotional issues giving birth to children that, are going, that they're going to mentor. Well, of course. I mean, you know, we as adults, you know, I, I, I say this, you know, there's so many adults out there who are going through IVF and all this stuff because all the GMO food are being infertile and stuff. So <clears throat> this is a problem. So you want to have this kid, and now this kid is suicidal at the age of 10. What the hell are you doing to this kid? Mm -hmm. they're living in your environment what are you doing they're doing the best they can with the skills they have well you know what my feeling is that if you're an adult and you don't have your own life together you really don't belong bringing a child into this world and actually i was i had to make that decision myself you know i had two sisters who are older than me i come from a family with severe mental health issues from my mom's side of the family with borderline personality disorder generalized anxiety and yeah. manic depression and quite frankly i have five one nephew and four nieces from the two sisters combined, and none of them are what I would consider emotionally normal. So I look at this and I was like, why would I want to bring a kid into the world? And my husband at the time, we're not divorced many years, you know, they had issues with alcoholism in his family. So you have mental health on my, my part. He has the thymia, as he had told me. And, and you have this alcoholism. We have the most beautiful kids. My, my, my ex is cute, okay? Really cute guy. But they would be emotionally shattered. Why do you want to bring a shattered person into this world? Please, mm. so I made a decision not to do it. Yeah, but sometimes, you know, you have to appreciate that it's like trying to, it's like locking the, the stable doors when the horse has already bolted. People don't always make that decision to go in, into having a child. It, it just happens. Or yeah, it's they have to be more thoughtful, Paula. You know what? You're bringing a person into this world you need to be selfless. It's not about you. It's about you being present for that kid. And if you cannot be present for that kid financially, emotionally, and have a good partnership with your mate so they learn how to have healthy relationships, because I do deal with sex addicts and I deal with romance addicts, and trust me, this is a problem. You do not belong having that kid. And thank God my dad made that ultimately clear to me in a letter he wrote me when I thanked him for sending me to college against his better judgment. But we, we are where we are, and now we are trying to address the symptoms of what has happened to our society and it is a societal problem right now oh yeah it is you know we have to we have to really think about you know it is a subtle problem because i don't know you guys i don't think have gmo food here they won't even of course we do, <laughs> we do. it's it's really scary because they're doing all kinds of really weird things think about this the GMO food is a seed that can take all these herbicides and, and insecticides, right? And then you're eating that stuff, and then they feed it to our animals, and our animals eat that. And then you're wondering what it's doing to our bodies and our minds, okay? Yeah. Then you have all these drugs being given out as if they're freaking candy, amphetamines to kids. You know, everyone's being said that they're, well, not everyone, but too many. 50% of all kids who are diagnosed with ADD, ADHD do not have it. They want kids to sit still in school all day long. I'm sorry. Kids are not made to sit still all day in school. They need recesses, they need gym, they need activity. This is called being a normal kid. And I can go back to my brother who died of leukemia. When I was two months old, he wasn't quite four. My mom knew that he wasn't healthy. Why? Because he wasn't active. It was 
you know, it showed right there. Mm -hmm. It took me a year and a half, the doctors, to figure out what's going on with him. But these are the truths in our lives. I mean, it's so crazy. <clears throat> Why are we handing out prescriptions? This is the freaking candy. They screw up the brain. Well, people tend to put their trust in the professionals and in the pharmaceuticals rather than taking responsibility for their own health. Is the well, it's true. <laughs> I'm actually, I, I just was watching a very um, <clears throat> intense thing, and I've heard this before, actually, in terms of why we don't have healthy cancer care today. It's based on cancer, but it's true of anything. We had something here called the Rockefellers and the Carnegie Foundations, big money. Yep. They align themselves with the medical schools, or medical schools align themselves with them so they could get the money for the research to make the pharmaceuticals. Why? Because it could be patented to make money. So we had like 220 homeopathic schools here in this country in the 1800s. It went down to two. They were bringing chiropractors and gelling them. They got rid of all the naturopaths and all the rest of the stuff that was holistic healing. Doctors don't know anything about nutrition. And Hippocrates himself said that, let the nutrition be, let your food be your medicine, right? Exactly. Food is our medicine. There's no, there's no disputing that. It's true of every freaking living being, including the plants. Excuse me. You know, Erickson, you know, he, he did this story or this one guy, at least they tell the story when he was taking care of an overweight man and he talked about, think about the tomato plants, right? <laughs> tomato plants, what do they need? They need some nitrogen, they need the water, they need the sunlight, and they're happy, right? And the soil. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we call nutrition, hello! <laughs> yeah, yeah. And your father is a doctor as well, isn't he? My dad was a dentist. He died in 85, sadly, but he was a, he was a general um, medical doctor of dentistry. He loved what he did. He did what he he loved from the age of five when it was really barbaric. In 1928, he decided he wanted to be a dentist. He didn't want to tie around his neck. He didn't want to commute to work. He wanted his own practice, and that's what he did, and he loved it. He, he, was great he, had, it. he, he had an amazingly curious mind, uh, but from the information that you've given about his quotes, he was also very, very wise. He, he said to you, nobody can take your authority away unless you let them. Absolutely true. It is. It really is. And I think a lot of us become complacent and we've allowed that authority to be taken away from us and put it in the trust of people who really haven't got our best interests is the first point. Absolutely true. And the second point is, how can we encourage people to take their authority back? The way that you take your authority back is you remember that every individual is a person. This is all they are. You know, you can look up to your gurus and they're going to, you're going to find that they've done things that maybe perhaps were not ethical or in an integrity, you know, and I had that happen with some of my trainers too. And it really let me know that I'm my own guru because I really do believe in a lot of the stuff that they do, but you know, their ethics went backwards instead of forwards. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you need to look at this person and see, are they people who are the, well, my dad also said, look for the top 1% of the top 1% and be that in your own field of profession as well. So if you realize that people are playing with you and they're talking out of both sides of the mouth, and as a hypnotist and NLP person in particular, you learn. Mm -hmm. This is what we help our clients to stop doing, right? Yes. <laughs> to put themselves yeah. in double binds. So when people are talking crap out of both ends of their mind, you out of their mouth, you realize that this may be not be an ethical person, number one. Number two, you need to understand that you have every right to have the things taken care of in an effective and meaningful way. Yeah. As much as possible. And if people are not able to do that, then perhaps they don't deserve to be in your life in some way, shape, or form. And I don't care if they're your parents. I threw my mom out of my life for seven years because she was very abusive to me. We were very, very close. She took care of my education. Thank you. And I was able to see her the last 10 years of her life because I was coming back from the West Coast, actually, to do hypnosis clients, frankly. And yeah. it so happened that she, she was dying at that point. And so I was able to do some healing stuff with her, which I wasn't planning on doing, by the way. But every time she had an issue, I was there. Why? Because my other sisters thought it was her mental illness and she was being hysterical and it wasn't true. But I knew the difference, having worked in the field for ages and ages, that when someone is dissociated emotionally when they're talking about a trauma happening, that that happened. And it was the same story over and over again. So I had to go rescue her out of a few situations that she got herself into. Not fun, but you do it. You yeah. do what you got to do. And that's having ethics and that's being an adult. And that's kind of what I learned from my old man. He could have left her, except she would have had five kids. <laughs> but he, he, her, he stayed with her, you know, all those years, even though she was crazy as and not easy to live with, my God. <laughs> he also said you can either own your own life or have someone else own it. Yes, yes, that was a very important thing. Actually, uh, he wanted to be in practice for himself because he wanted to own his own world. So what does that mean? He could work the hours he wanted to work with the patients he wanted to work with, 
had the vendors he wanted to work with <clears throat> and dissociated himself from anybody he wasn't interested in being in work with, mm -hmm. which meant that he was controlling his own world. Because this is the thing, when you work for other people, like let's say I, I worked in some kind of other business for somebody else, okay? I have to deal with their clients. I have to deal with them. I have to deal with my coworkers. And I've dealt with a lot of bad, bad angry, horrible people over the years, my God, in, 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 in the business of business. And you know, the reality of the situation is, why go there if you don't have to? Yeah, it's and, like you, and you we, we, we all have the resources inside of, of us to do anything we want. Absolutely, we do. I'll tell you, you know, it's interesting to say that Stuart Wilde talks about this and how you have to do this. You know, the problem is that today in the Western world, everyone is running around all over the place and they don't even know why. Mm -hmm. They have no idea why. You're doing the same five days a week if you work and the same two days a week on your weekends over and over again, Groundhog Day, right? Why? Why are we doing this? What is your passion? What is your purpose? What do you give a damn about in this life? Until unless you get really quiet mm. and do your sacred things. He was this metaphysic metaphysician, one of the best in, ever. <laughs> Excuse me. He got into this whole idea of understanding about that which we do not see in this material world and understanding that we need to get very quiet. We need to be in the sacred. We need to stop touting ourselves and just allow people to feel our positive energy and come to us and then we can do the things that we need to do you know with them instead of sitting there whining and crying and playing victim or blaming the world for your problems as we learned in nlp i love this nlp all right so be a cause versus effect right if a person is an effect what are they doing tell me person in effect what are they doing they're being a victim they're yeah what do victims do um, just in their own self, wallowing in their own self pity and tell their stories over and over and over again. Well, yes, they do that, but they want someone else to save them. They don't want to make any changes. They blame the world. They think someone out there is going to help them. Uh uh, sorry, people, don't work that way. What happens is we have to be at cause. So the equation is cause is greater than effect. So we have to get into the cause. Things, cause is making things happen. Of course, and realizing that it's within yourself that you need to change, and then the world around you will change yeah. to the degree that the people around you are able to, because if they are stunted in growth because of these addictions we we're talking about before, mm -hmm. and it's not just drug addiction, it's any addiction, being stuck on yourself, blame the world, whatever the addiction is, we don't care. From the spiritual world, they call it addiction, right? Being stuck on yourself. Yeah. Basically, the issue is that you need to be real with yourself, be it cause. Do the changes you need to do. Take responsibility for your life. Make those changes so you can move on in your life and definitely find your compelling future. Guess what? You can have a beautiful life. And it's not about, as the Kabbalists would say, it's not about the chaos running around you. It's about how are you going to operate within the chaos because you know that you're bigger and more valuable than the idiocy of the chaos around you. Exactly. Beautiful, you know? If, if, uh, if you could only value yourself in that way, extraordinary things will begin to happen for you. And that's why we do the work that we do, because you have to understand if someone's been abused. Now, this is a point about the abuse situation, okay? Mm -hmm. Abuse happens very subtly over a long period of time. Yes. So people don't even realize necessarily that they're being abused. I had a client who dated this gentleman, for, well, not really a gentleman, he was a sociopath, but anyway, <laughs> this man for 10 years got married. She had bought her parents' house from her siblings. He was a hoarder, filled it up with all this crap. He lied to her about getting their taxes redone or whatever they needed to do and re- I don't know, whatever. He was trying to sell things of hers that were valuable and lying about the whole thing. And this is a guy that she was married to for 10 years after dating for 10 years. Total sociopath, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. and it happened just over time. She did not realize that when he was not letting her talk to her siblings or her friends, that's abuse. And when, when a young child is abused, sexually abused or abused any other way, they actually don't know because they can't rationalize, they have nothing to compare it to. So they hold that within them. And the statistics here in the UK is that as many as one in three uh, children are sexually abused by a sibling or someone they know. No, it's true. And you know, we worry about, you know, what are strangers doing to us? Hello, people, get real. It's the people in your own family, in your own friends, in your own neighborhood, okay? That's the people who are doing the abuse. Well, actually, this is a very good point that you make, okay? Because what happens is, First of all, when a child is really, really young and they don't even understand what sex is, and I found that, well, actually, um, oh, shit, what's the guy's name? I'm trying to think of the guy's name. Um, they'll come to me. Anyway, <clears throat> what happens is when we have people who have become sex addicts, okay, they are sex addicts because when they're very, very tiny children, like infants, the right orbital 
cortex needs to relate to the mother or the caretaker's right or vocal cortex. And that's what develops the amygdala, the emotions. Yeah. And the hippocampus to make safe connections. Okay. That's what they call in psychiatry. <clears throat> right. When that doesn't happen, then they never feel that those connections are happening. Even with a sexual act, they never feel connected. All right. So that's how that develops. So when my guys come to me, I tell them, you know, we're not really interested in the fact that you have the sex addiction, the action, what we're interested in is helping you clear up and love yourself. Learn how to love yourself because you never got that from your parent, all right? And then you can learn the boundaries and love how to love somebody else. So that's actually the dynamic there. 85% of these people, they've been molested. And in my practice alone, about 80% of those, it happened before they even knew what sex was. Now, something very interesting happens in this dynamic. You think you're special, but you also know it's wrong. Yeah, and that's why it you from a deep Plus, yeah, you Number do. one, sex, stress release is what? Sexual orgasm, you know? So they're hitting like two stones with one action, actually. Or it could go the other way and they don't want sex at all. Well, that happens to the rigid, rigid women who actually come from Catholic backgrounds, I think, for the most part, because they're taught that sex is only there to have babies. See, in the Jewish tradition, sex is beautiful and you're supposed to enjoy it. So there mm. you go. <laughs> okay well you know this show has been so enlightening um and it's talked about so many aspects but there is one parting gift that you are going to leave us with. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to explain what that is well we have people you want to specifically do people who have lost people through mm -hmm. suicide yes okay. yes so what i'm going to do is i'm going to guide everyone through a process it is going to be a combination of, of it's going to be sort of like neurolinguistic programming done in like a hypnotic state you know in, in terms of deeper trance and we're going to do this beautiful beautiful thing where we're going to do this healing process so i think the best way to do it is just to do it because that's the way all hypnosis for me it just is just called through i had actually a client i'll tell you the backstory take two seconds who came to me who was a teenager at the time she lost three four four friends in the last three years she was actually a 16-year-old kid at the time she came in. She was having problems with her hockey coach, ice hockey. Her mother wrote a little note letting me know this. So I created this thing right on the spur of the moment to help her to clear it, and it worked beautifully well. So we can go ahead and do that process, like right now. Yep. Do they, does everyone have to sit with their feet on the ground, relax? Right, I'll tell you how to go. I'll give you 15 seconds exactly to get yourselves positioned. I need you either in a recliner, <clears throat> in a bed with your head up, because we're not sleeping, we're doing hypnosis, with your legs up. Or on a couch with your legs up and your head up so that I can put you into a nice, easy trance state. Course, and all if, you you're if you're driving or operating machinery, this is not for you. Exactly. Do it later. You can watch it as a recording. <laughs> Just a warning, please. If you are driving yes. or operating machinery, uh, please switch off now and then tune in later on. Exactly. Because we don't want any accidents to happen. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, are we ready to go? We're going to let them get into their positions. and. Yeah. <clears throat> they're probably there by now so what I want you all to do is I just want you to you can take off your glasses too if you want to do it Paul it's up to you you don't need glasses to do hypnosis as far as I know mm -hmm. so <clears throat> great now what I want you to do is keep your eyes open starting with your eyes open okay I want you to gaze on a spot slightly above eye level and what's gonna happen is your eyes are gonna get very 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 tired physiologically they will when they start blinking gently close them and do allow them to blink because that's what they do. You can go ahead and close them, Paul. They're blinking right now. Good. Now, what I want you to do is I want you just to take the little teeny weeny muscles by the side of your eyes where your eyelids meet. And I want you to relax them so fully, so completely that they are so heavy in that relaxation that the harder you try to open them, the more close they stay. And you'll notice that you'll get this thing called eye catalepsy and hypnospeak. When your eyes stay closed and your eyebrows rise, go ahead and make that happen. And as I tell my people in my lives, if a five-year-old, 10-year-old can do this in five seconds, you can too. All right. Paula has it, but I'll give other people a couple more moments to do it because some people have to do it twice before they get it. <laughs> Perfect. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to take that relaxation that you feel in your eyes and you're going to move it to the top of your head, down to the bottom of your toes. And you're going to do this after I count to three and snap my fingers. Anything hypnosis, no thinking involved. Just allow it to happen. The unconscious subconscious knows exactly how to do it. Here we go. One, two, three. Just allow that relaxation to flow through. It feels very, very, very wonderful. 
you know, notice that you're breathing a little more deeply and that you're feeling maybe heavier or lighter. We're gonna do this again and you're gonna go 10 times deeper, relax again, just allow it to happen. It will happen very naturally. Here we go. One, two, three. Allowing the relaxation to go from head to toe. Beautiful. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to create a beautiful staircase, spiral in shape, floating in the sky. <clears throat> Hypnosis is all about fantasy. And to the degree, some of you might be able to see it, other of you will just feel it. However you do it is perfectly great. And just create that staircase however you can and make it beautiful, something of carved wood or marble because this is your magical staircase, M-A-J-I-C-K-A-L. Actually, it's what you're creating so we can do some magic here today using your thoughts to disappear some negativity. Well, when you have that in your imagination, just give me a nod. Great. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go down these stairs together and we're going to double the relaxation. Two times as relaxed with each step we go down. Understand that any outside noises are going to send you deeper relaxed unless there's an emergency, in which case you'll be able to attend to it. My voice is very soothing and calming to you as we do this hypnosis. Starting at the top stair, going to the ninth, to the eighth, deeper, deeper, relaxed. To the seventh, to the sixth, to the fifth, feeling totally at peace, totally at calm, inside and out. To the fourth, to the third, the second, deeper, deeper, relaxed you go. Step one, and now I want you to go to step zero, and on step zero, you're going to go to a place either in your imagination or a place that you've been, but the thing is that there's nobody there. You're there all alone, and there's nothing you need to do except to just be, and you're just gonna be until I tell you to do otherwise. Now, what I would like you to do is leave that part of your mind there and allow the other part of your mind to come with me. It knows how to do it. And I want you to call in your divine, whatever your divine is. <clears throat> so call in if it's Jesus or the creator of the universe, just call it in and give you 10 seconds to do that. And then we're gonna go to your divine so that you feel totally protected as you do this next piece. All right, now, we're going to count up to 10, and you're going to be with your divine. <clears throat> so here we go. One, two, three, four, five, halfway there, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Take a nice deep breath in. Exhale. Now, this is what I want you to do. For the person who lost his suicide, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to go to the time when you last saw them, the time that you enjoyed being with them. So just go there now. And I just want you to experience the fun that you had with them at that time. They were in a positive place this last time. It was the last time you saw them in a positive place. So go there now. Now, take a nice deep breath in, exhale. Now what I want you to do is I want you to go to the time when you found out that they were gone, they were no longer alive. You might have found out that they committed suicide at the time, maybe not, but I'd like you to go to the time that you found out that they were no longer alive and perhaps that they had committed suicide. So go there now. And I just want you to go there for about 10 seconds just so you recognize that this happened. Take a nice deep breath in, exhale. Now, I want you to go, if they had a wake, I want you to go to the wake, and I want you to imagine what the people were saying about this person in their life and what they meant to them. Just pick up those things, and I want you to feel the positive aspects about this person as you're there at the wake, so go do that now.
Great, take a deep breath in. Exhale. I want you to go now to the funeral. So you're going to the funeral. And again, you're gonna hear the eulogies that were done, whatever the priest or you know, whoever was the person who was leading it, all the beautiful things that happened and the beautiful feelings that you had regarding this person. And you might've even been visited by the person. Who knows, sometimes that happens. So go there now and go experience it. Great, take a deep breath in, exhale. Now you're going to the after thing that, I want you to go to the um, graveside, <clears throat> where they're buried or you know, whatever's going on there, memorial service, whatever the situation was, go there. And again, you're paying your respects, you're listening to all the wonderful things about this person, and you're coming to terms with what happened, and you're gently letting this go. <clears throat> so go ahead and go there now and experience it. Great, take a deep breath in, exhale. Now what I want you to do is I want you to bring this person into your heart and your soul and to know that you carry them within you. All the positive aspects are always there. You love this person, you cared about this person a lot. They're still there, they're in their soul state right now. So I want you to bring them in. I want you to feel them there with you. Go ahead, let me know when you feel them with you. <clears throat> and I want you to let them know that you always love them, you'll always treasure them, and that they're always a piece of you and that you're always carrying them in your heart, always. And that you know through hypnosis that you can always talk to them and they're there to guide you. I do that with my loved ones all the time. So it's there, it's possible. And just feel them there, hug them in, and when you know that it feels really, really good, all I want you to do is say, done. Done. Good. Now, take a nice deep breath in, exhale. Now. I want you to go back to your age when you were when you lost this person, <clears throat> right? And I want you to go ahead and I want you to tell her, in your case, Paul, I don't know what the other people are, but tell, your, tell yourself, the younger self, that there was nothing you could have done to change this. It was the person's, where they were at, they were doing their own journey and doing their own evolution. This is what they needed to do. You had nothing to do with it. And go ahead and forgive the self and just let your inner child know that it's okay. It's the way it needed to be. There's nothing you could have done. And to love her and let her know that from now on, this person's a part of you and everything is fine. I want you to hug this person close to you, this younger you. Feel the pink blanket of love and protection and the white light around you. And when those disappear, your inner child will be healed. So just give me a nod when that happens. Great. Now what I want you to do is I want you to take a deep breath in. Exhale. Check in with your inner child and see how she's doing. You can talk. It's fine. She's, she's okay. Great. All right. Now what I want you to do. <clears throat> all right. You had two, right? You had two people? Mm -hmm. Okay. So quickly what I want you to do right now is I want you to bring up the other one. The other, the other person. And just go through the phase. I just want you to see her first. When... You know, the last first time when, when the last time when she was really happy. You got that? Okay, good. Take a deep breath in. It's a, it's a he. A he, I'm sorry. Take a deep breath in. Exhale. And I just want you to just go through the process that we just did. I just want you to go to the time when you heard that, that he had suicided himself. I want you to go to the wake, the funeral, and do all that stuff. And let me know when you, when you did all that, all right? Just nod when that's done.
Remember, it's all positive things. Yeah. All right. All right. It's all set. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and feel him in you. He is a part of you. All right. Let him know that you love him. You carry him always inside you. All right. Now, <clears throat> take a deep breath in. Exhale. Go to the age that you were when he passed. All right. And I want you to let her know there was nothing she could have done to stop this. It was something he chose to do. But he's now inside you forever. Hug her close. Pink blanket of love and protection, the white light. When they disappear, you know that she's healed, meaning your younger self. All set? Go check in and see how she's doing. Perfect. Take a nice That's deep breath here. Exhale. Now, we're not quite done yet, all right? Because I have to get you out of your super higher consciousness <laughs> and your unconscious. All right. So thank your super conscious for helping you do this clearing work today. And now I'm going to count you down to your subconscious. You leave your eyes open because we have to thank the unconscious because it's like a child, all right? It needs to be appreciated for getting you to the unconscious. To the super conscious. So here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, halfway there, 4, 3, 2, 1. Take a deep breath in. Exhale. Thank your unconscious mind for helping you get to the super conscious. And now I'm going to bring you up at the count of five. Count of one, thank yourself for taking this time to do this work. And do this clearing kind of to know that you have everything inside yourself to do what you need to do most of the time and if you need help you know there's people there to help you ask for it there's nothing wrong with that we all need it from time to time kind of three take a nice deep breath in exhale kind of four move around your hands and your arms your legs and your feet staying safe at all times kind of five wide alert and clear welcome back how are you doing miss paul <laughs> uh yeah it's quite emotional actually Aren't you glad we did this little interview and this little clearing for you? I told you it could yeah. be done. Well, I've been doing this for ages. People can use this as well for themselves um, through they, this hypnosis session as well. Yeah, let them, yeah, they can use this, you know, at the end of it. You know, anyone who's gone through this, when you do your tagging on it, just let them know at the end there is a clearing for people who have lost loved ones. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be a suicide. This is what it was. But they can... No, the unconscious mind can, can help them to make it for anyone who they lost, especially if they had anger, so yeah. important to release it because they have mixed feelings, you know, and then they find out the person actually did love them. I had that happen with a client actually with his father. And I actually anchored his love, his newly found love to his father to yeah. stop the alcoholic drinking that wrecked his like uh, brand new truck, $3,000 worth of damage, so he stopped drinking. So we never know what's going to happen in a person's mind in terms of their conscious unconscious is two totally different things. And that's why I always tell people, I don't care if you think you cleared it consciously, you didn't do anything until you've done it in your unconscious and especially the super conscious, but yeah. something very deep and meaningful to especially your child. So. And people really um, would benefit from understanding the power of hypnosis. I know when I was first introduced to hypnosis, I just said, what a load of rubbish. And the person that did do. the hypnosis <laughs> with me, uh, it was for pain. And I was in so much pain in my neck from my fourth vertebrae hmm. um, that I got spondylosis in the fourth vertebrae and it stopped the use of my arm. I literally uh -huh. could not run anymore. I couldn't exercise. I couldn't drive. I couldn't work. The only thing That's I a lot could, of grieving. <laughs> it was a lot of grieving and I had to go and live in a hot country. So at least I could feel uh, more comfortable. And I was on these massive painkillers. And one of my friends visited who was a hypnotherapist. And she said, Oh, let me do a session with you using um, imagery. And I had no expectations whatsoever that this would work for me. And she left some post hypnotic suggestions. And within a month, the whole condition uh, I'd was now pain free. The condition will always be there, I will always have spondylosis, but the perception of pain had gone and I could run, I could do exercise. Yeah, I could life back, baby cakes. <laughs> yeah, it, it was absolutely amazing. And unfortunately, we are not friends anymore. But what she did for me, uh, I am eternally grateful for. This is another thing that I, I'm glad you brought that up because you see, this is another thing that people kind of think that you're going to have the same friends for your entire life. Let me tell you something. People grow at different levels. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is what happened between me and my ex yep. and are at different rates. People get involved in different things. Some people grow, some people don't. Mm -hmm. And over time, what can happen is 
as you evolve in your life and you're growing, hopefully you're growing, right, and evolving, the people who were okay back in your younger years no longer are there because they don't relate to you. You don't relate to them. I had a, I had a friend from college. Oh, my God, it's so funny. This woman, she's actually been on my lives a few times now, and we were really, really close in, in college. We're going back to 79 to 83, okay, so it's a long time ago now. And she was still still doing a lot of drinking. She'd go, she was an attorney. She was working for the government for years and years and years. Nice professional job, whatever. But every weekend, she'd go to the beach house and sometime go drinking every Friday night with all her lawyer friend, whatever. So it's really, I don't know, disgusting bar, whatever. And I'm here helping people get over this crap. Obviously, I have nothing in common with her. So one day, I just wrote her a letter. She got really mad at me because she wanted me to explain to her why somebody was upset about something. And she's like, I'm not here to do psychoanalysis with you. Why do you always call wanting something? She got really pissed. She was totally drunk, smoking her cigarette. She kept me on the phone for like three hours. I finally wrote her a letter. I said, you know, we've been friends for 25 years. We're in different places. You're still going, getting drunk every freaking weekend and every Friday. I help people overcome these things. I'm not interested. It's okay. So yeah. then several years later, right? I'm maybe 10 years later. I'm, I'm serious. She, she Facebooks me, right? This Facebook friend. She wants to know what's going on with my family. I said, you know what? You got two email addresses, two phone numbers. Use them. I don't do anything on Facebook. I don't trust it. So we did have a phone call after that. And, and I updated her in you know, different situations. And actually, we, we had a common friend in college who passed away pretty early in life at the age of 57 on the operating room table in Florida while on vacation last March 1st. Yeah. So it took me forever to find her on Facebook. She changed her name, her last name, because of the craziness with our current president. And then I found her. And I just want to let her know. So we got together a little bit during that time. And she was really grateful that I let her know about his passing. But let me tell you, things do change. And it's okay. It is okay. I'm, I'm okay. We're going to be left behind. With where I am. And I hope that she's okay where she is. We just send them love and light. Stuart would say love and light. All the cobblers, love and light. You know, hypnotists, NLP people, love and light. You just send them love and light. That's all you do. And at this moment, we're sending love and light out to everyone. Yes, to everybody to, to do their healing work. And, you know, yeah. you just... If, if, you, if you've lost anybody at all, this is a really good, this is the end process that I do after I help people let go of all the other reasons that they might be depressed for this specific yeah. situation with these people. So you're going to get some really nice healing. You saw Paula totally change her total affect after doing this. And how long did that take? I don't know. I didn't time it. 10, 15 minutes max to do both of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was amazing, amazing. right? Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And it's been a wonderful show. And I am absolutely sure that people listening that can uh, relate to what we've been talking to can take something away from this and start creating better stories, start living the life that they really desire. Desire and deserve. And also, yeah. people remember, don't forget the physiology part of it too, okay? Because mm -hmm. it's not always of the mind, okay? If you have a loss, if you have something that you haven't been able to do that you want to do, if you have, you know, if you have depression running your family, things of this nature, it could be, but don't forget that if we're not getting the proteins to break down the amino acids mm -hmm. to make our neurotransmitters in our guts, we're going to have a problem. If we have a slow thyroid, if we have slow um, adrenal glands and things like this happening, or if we have other things with um, medication side effects happening, you know what? We have to go to the cause of the problem. Just because it looks emotional doesn't mean it is. It could be a combination of both. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have to know, just like with my sister, when I did the pain control on the everything nerves thing that I did on the yeah. Facebook page, Suzanne Kellner's Inc. You might want to put that in your notes. We did one for fibromyalgia and we did one for peripheral neuropathy due to a car accident she was in when she was 14 years old. She was riding her bike to my dad, the dentist's office, got hit by a car and had a compound fracture of her tibia of her left leg. And now it's affecting both her legs. So it's two different kinds of pain. You need two different kinds of pain control with her on that. Mm -hmm. Yes, she's highly suggestible. She would never let me do any of this stuff with her one-on-one, -on -one, but she's allowing me to do it in front of millions of people. Go figure. <laughs> well, maybe 40 to 50 to over 100. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and I'm doing it in front of thousands of people right now with uh, having hyp hypnosis uh, live on the air. Amazing. Well, yeah, I do it actually um, every day at Suzanne Kellner's Inc. Um, <clears throat> you can put that in there. And I'm also doing one for, for medical people who are really depressed about their practices and being part of a medical industrial complex that does not allow them to practice the way they need to. It's not about writing prescriptions and doing referrals. It's about learning about the family, learning about the environment. So that's at reclaiming your practice in your life. Yeah. And then the other thing is um, 
All right, so the, the, the Susan Connor Zinc one is from three to five generally. Eastern time, USA. I always write that because we don't want to get confused with Australia. Yeah. And, then, um, and then the other one I do at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time for reclaiming your practice in your life. And I use the AFR stamp for the end. Okay. Yeah, so hey, I, I will put all the links with the um, radio show with when, it goes, when it's on the replay. And I will also put all the links on YouTube when it goes onto YouTube. Yeah, it's all on my Facebook pages, so you can find that pretty easily. I have a million of them, but that's the two that you need for that. And, of course, as you anticipated, Suzanne, we have run way over time. But did you have a good time? Was it working? <laughs> Absolutely. What do you think? Yeah. Time, okay. you. time is so just much. something human beings made up to make us really frustrated, okay? Yes. We take the time. As my dad told me in the office, another one of his sayings is I was helping him to pass equipment. I think we were cementing a crown or something. And I'm looking at the clock this way. He said, Suzanne. No one, oh, Susie at that time. Susie, no one gets ahead in life looking at the clock. I don't look at the clock. I just do what I need to do to get the job done correctly and completely. I say, so can I wish you a, a very good rest of the day? Absolutely. And if you want to do this again for another subject that comes up, by all means, just let me know. Now you know what it's like to do an interview with Mrs. Ann. Thank you very much. <laughs> you are amazing. You are amazing. Thank you. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I go into trance with you all. It's, it's, you know, it is a calling and it's a gift. And as such, it needs to be out there for the people who truly need it. And that's why I'm happy to help the people who really need this work done, okay. as you do. So it's goodbye from Paula to the audience. And it's goodbye from? Suzanne Kellner-Zing. Glad to be of some help and to see, see her eyes. She's just glowing. We like to see people glow in a matter of 15 minutes. It's beautiful. Exactly. I am. I can feel my face glowing. Yeah. I, I, I hold a mirror up to my clients' faces when they're done with the whole transformation thing. I say, look at your face. Notice okay. anything just different? Just look at the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it's definitely glowing. Thank you very much, Susan. You're very welcome. <laughs> That's what you get for asking me to be on and making it happen. It's very simple, right? It's marvelous. Okay. Goodbye. Take care. You. If you want to have me on again, you know how to reach me. It's the same thing all over the world, don't matter where I am. All right? <laughs> Make time for the things that matter in life. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.